Hello, everybody. Let me give you a moment as we go live and begin. Um, I'm getting an echo of my own voice, so we'll see if we can troubleshoot that. I am doing that as well. Troubleshoot that. All right. Welcome to Club Book with Nick Hornby. I'm Andrea right. Swenson. I'm based in Minneapolis. Welcome to Club Book with Nick Hornby. I'm Andrea Swenson. I'm, I'm getting an echo of my own <laughs> voice. <laughs> I already don't really like hearing my own voice, so um, this is like torture to me. <laughs> is it coming back? Uh, Andrea and Nick, I'm going to recommend you both. Um, turn uh, down the volume on your computers. Um, uh, turn down the volume. Or that was my next best suggestion. If you had fed headphones, wonderful. Or that was my next. I I haven't got headphones. All right, let's see if let's see how this goes. I think the feedback was on Andrea's end, so that should do it. I'm still hearing two versions of Nick. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, well, that did the trick on our end, Andrea. So if you are able to um, read the introduction uh, and then be judicious in when you put the headphones on and off uh, to keep yourself sane, but this is this is good on our end. Okay. All right, thanks for being a trooper. <laughs> okay. All right, let's give this a shot. Uh, so as I said, I'm Andrea Swenson. I'm a music journalist and an author based in Minneapolis. Um, my first book was called The Got to Be Something Here, The Rise of the Minneapolis Sound. I'm currently working on uh, my second book, which is about Jimmy Jam's father, Cornbread Harris. Um, I also host and produce the official Prince podcast and contribute liner notes to new Prince uh, box sets as they come out, which has been just an incredible honor and thrill. And part of why I'm here today to talk to you about this very um, princely topic. Uh, before I introduce our guest today properly, allow me a moment to tell you a bit about this unique series that is bringing him to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Carver County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk, Carver County being, of course, where Paisley Park is. Thanks also to partnering bookseller Red Balloon Bookshop, a purchase link to Dickens and Prints, a particular kind of genius will be available in the comment section of this live stream feed. Have it shipped, pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul or have them deliver it personally to your door if you're in the area. One final housekeeping note, also in the comments, you'll see a survey link. Melsa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program. It's quick and easy. Now for our featured event. According to a poll conducted by the BBC, novelist and screenwriter Nick Hornby ranks as one of the most influential people in British culture. Hornby may be best known to American readers for his chart-topping novels High Fidelity, About a Boy, and Juliet Naked, each of which has been adapted for the screen. Hornby's beloved memoir Fever Pitch, centered around the author's sports fanaticism, likewise spanned, spawned two feature films of the same name. Hornby's equally impressive screenplay credits include recent Oscar contenders in Education, Wild, and Brooklyn. In addition to Best Picture nominations, an Education and Brooklyn put Hornby in contention for the Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay. His latest book offers fans something of a departure. Dickens and Prince, a particular kind of genius, explores the creative styles and unlikely similarities between a world-famous Victorian novelist and Minnesota's homegrown music superstar, Prince. We're going to do a Q&A first, but we will have time today for an audience Q&A. So please drop your questions in the comment thread here on Facebook. And our tech manager is going to route them to me so I can present them to Nick. If you'd prefer to contribute a question a bit more anonymously, you can also send a private message to Club Book here on Facebook, or you can send an email 
to clubbookmn at gmail.com. And there we have it. I'm so excited to be talking to you today, Nick. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. Um, it's miserable and dark in November in London, but uh, it's nice to be somewhere where there's daylight, even if I can't see it. <laughs> yes, we got our first snow this week. Uh, oh, I'm, wow. a Min I'm a Minnesotan, so I also need to tell you about the weather before we can talk about anything else. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, we're all adapting now because it just turned on a dime and all of a sudden it's cold and it's snowy and everything's frozen and it's it's on. Winter is here. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, I have, a, you know, kind of a pretty basic question to start with, and I've noticed that in all of the interviews that you've done so far about this book, it's almost like an accus accusatory question, like, what were you thinking? <laughs> but but <laughs> pl please tell us, you know, where did this idea come from? Why did you write this book about Dickens and Prince? Well, it started with the Sign of the Times uh, box set, and... Um, and reading that um, Prince was working on three or more albums at once, um, which eventually got boiled down to Sign of the Times. Uh, this is where I feel weird, Andrea, because you, you know, you probably is sitting there thinking, oh my God, is that what he actually thinks? Um, what the point being that Prince was working on more than one thing at once, that um, required, I mean, they were very different records and they required different skill sets. And um, I was reminded just by reading this that um, Dickens used to work on more than one novel at once. Um, and it just sort of came into my mind, oh, that's weird. But, um, and then when I, in the next few minutes, I was thinking, wow, they both did an awful lot as well. And, and then later on, I thought, well, neither of them lived to see 60. And, um, and then just more and more things started to come. And when I, I thought, maybe I'll write an essay about this, or I'll try and write an essay about this, and I started investigating, I found that there are all sorts of things I wanted to write about um, in terms of creativity and the business. And, um, you know, they both got very upset about the business side of things. Um, they both had difficult childhood, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I didn't know whether there would be enough for a book length piece, but the more I thought, the more I realized that there might be. I'm curious, you know, how would you describe the genre of this book? Because you've written in so many different formats you're you know we know you best for your work in fiction and memoir but you're also a critic you've written music criticism and book criticism like how, what genre would you place this in I think it's a work of criticism really um I mean slightly offbeat but um I am comparing two artists of st similar stature and in that way um it seems not very controversial. I, I guess the, the surprise for people is that one's a Victorian novelist and one was a 20th and 21st century pop star. Uh, but actually, one of the things I realised I was doing was comparing superstars from different eras. And there weren't many 19th century superstars, actually, because we tended to hang out in our own cultures then. But Dickens was one of the very few people who cracked America, very few from Europe or anywhere else that was a big star in America. So that made the comparison kind of valid, actually. Yeah. Um, I thought it was so, I mean, this it's such an interesting approach and idea to begin with. But as I was reading the book, that I had so many moments where I was thinking, you know, how is this going to work? Are we actually going to feel you know, a connection between these two. And then you would get to these like aha moments. Uh, I think the first one that really stood out to me was you compared um, the way that Dickens used the Pickwick papers to kind of serialize and reach audiences in this new way with the way that Prince used MTV to release music videos and release audiences in this way. How, how did you get to these moments where you're, was it just like making a big nerd chart of like these two parallel lives and seeing where you might find these overlaps? Or I'm just curious, like how did that, that kind of um, 
process play out for you of kind of comparing them? Well, um, I mean, I was reading lots of um, biography and lots of essays and, um, uh, you know, in the, in the Dickens instance, it became quite clear that he'd started serializing books around the time that, A, the book market in England was for various reasons collapsing a bit, and B, when train travel was starting um, and, and people were beginning to use trains. And um, we have a, a, a chain of magazine bookstores here called WH Smith, um, which, you know, is still there now, has always been there all my life and started when Dickens was doing these books and they sell a small selection of paperbacks, a lot of magazines. And that's where Dickens sold some of his serialization. So it's these moments where um, technology and creativity hit. I think we forget how much technology has to do with creativity. Like, you know, whether it's the printing press or the invention of 45s, the invention of 33s. Um, people of my age or anyone over probably 45 think that the vinyl 12 inch is the perfect form. But that was a, a kind of a fluke that happened once we'd moved off 78, that they found ways of cramming more music onto a slide. And um, it, it doesn't stop there, of course, because CDs got longer and now CDs have gone and it's an album can be really any length. And, and people respond to those changes in form in different ways. So that's a long way of saying that when I read about Prince, they talked about MTV. When I read about Dickens, they talked about the railways and WH Smith. And if you're comparing the two, it's kind of unmissable that, that these two things are happening, that, that what's going on in society, of course, affects the way an artist releases things and how those things are consumed. Right, right. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, something else that really struck me early on in, in reading the book was that you are also in the book um, and not in a way where it's, you know, comparing Prince and Dickens and Hornby, but you show up and, and insert some of your own thoughts and your own creative process. And I thought that was really insightful and, and cool, you know, as someone that so respects your work and, and your legacy. How did you come to that decision of, um, you know, having a little bit of that personal element as well? It sort of comes naturally to me. I mean, um, in my columns that I write for the Believer magazine, um, uh, I say every month, but whenever the Believer magazine exists, um, it's very much about, those columns are very much about how I interact with books. And, um, and I kind of lose the, the uh, typical critical voice where you keep yourself out of it. And I'm saying, ah, this book was really slow for me, but that's partly because my kid was in hospital for a week, you know, um, that sort of thing, which is very important, I think, as a way of um, admitting that we, we are not always good readers. Sometimes we are good readers, sometimes we're not. Um, and there are things in our lives that affect the way that we consume things. Um, in the case of this book, I, I have experience of some of these things. I have experience of a, um, a successful professional creative life and um, I, I can compare my writing experience to those of Dickens, even though we're not of a similar stature. Um, I know how long it takes me to do things. I know um, how long it takes other people to do things. And this seemed all worth talking about in the context of how people make stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I have so many questions about you. <laughs> I want to make sure we're still talking about Prince and Dickens, but um, I was curious to know, you know, thinking about their lives and their trajectories of their career, they each had this moment where suddenly they're famous and they're, mm -hmm. you know, in the mainstream spotlight and there's all this pressure coming in and, and you talk a little bit about how each of them respond to that. I'm curious, you know, as someone that's also been through a bit of that process, especially with high fidelity and suddenly being, you know, a known entity in the US as a as an author and as someone that 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 contributed to the incredible film. Um, 
you know, what what did you notice about the way they reacted compared to how you reacted? Were there any familiarities there? Well, I think um, I think that when you become well known, and you know, this is in the context of me, not in the context of them, which was something very different. But um, it's very hard to keep a level head. Um, and I had this interesting experience, really, that my first book, Fever Pitch, was um, a very big thing in England. And, um, and I got blamed for all sorts of things as well. Um, I think the, the same thing sort of happened in America, not regarding my book, but there came a point where sport became a commodity and um, um, people are buying executive boxes and you know there are uh, all kinds of ways of consuming sport that took it away from its traditional roots. And my book came out, Fever Pitch came out at the time when that was happening with soccer and, uh, and I got blamed for it. They say, oh, this guy writing a book, now all these people are turning up who've never been before. Um, and it was so much more complicated than that. Mostly it was Rupert Murdoch's money that was making people turn up to football matches. But um, I could be reading about something completely different and I would turn up in the piece. And um, I felt that I couldn't control the conversation. Um, that, um, I, I would look nervously at the newspaper and I think, oh, if it's, this is about men or sport or music or something, I might be in here and I don't necessarily want to read it. And uh, it, it was interesting. And um, I think for all sorts of reasons, I stepped away from some of that. But uh, in the 90s, it was um, it was a weird time. I I. I I went once went into a, a news agent um, and uh, there was a magazine on the shelf that I just happened to look at. And on the cover of the magazine, it said, should Nick Hornby be shot? <laughs> and that was on the cover. And um, it was like some kind of fanzine thing. And I thought, oh, this is this wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> so you can you can lose track of who you are, you can um, get paranoid, you can um, become more private than you were before, all of these things. And, um, uh, and that was my experience, which was quite a small experience. But these people, it was on a global scale. Right. So how did you interpret how Prince reacted to his fame? I understood a lot of it, really. Um, I mean, I do think it's interesting, and I, I, I wanted to ask you if, if I got this right, but it feels to me that we know more about Dickens and his life than we do about Prince and his life, that Prince was uh, somehow managed to control an awful lot of information about um, his growing up and, and the adulthood that he had outside of the spotlight as well. Um, and this Victorian novelist, we, we kind of know everything about him. He, he collaborated in his own autobiography that was written by a friend, and um, he, he didn't have the same um, suspicion, I don't think, that Prince had. But it, it, was I right in that, that information about Prince's early life is hard to come by? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're, you're totally correct that he was very... Um systematic in the way that he guarded that information and I do wonder too is it different because not as much time has passed I mean will people uncover more about his life and maybe people that knew him over time feel more comfortable speaking about him and, and things that happened to him now that he's gone maybe um although I was working on a on a project that uh I'm no longer working on about the Rolling Stones. And um, one of the things that struck me when I was doing a lot of research is that the media in the 1960s was very impermanent. I mean, all the promotion they did was either on TV that a lot of it was destroyed, radio programs that no longer exist, and teen magazines. 
Um, and and you, there's no way you're going to get 5,000 words in the New Yorker in 1965 about what it's like to be a Rolling Stone. That stuff didn't exist. And that was true to a certain extent, even in the 80s, um, that serious magazines and newspapers did not spend millions of words on popular culture. Um, we're used to that now, and you would find a huge piece on prints in, in the New York or, or the New York Times. But um, at the beginning of this career, I think it was, media was different. And um, the, the seriousness with which people took Dickens meant that, even at the time, um, meant that he was a personality and he's someone who wrote a lot and wrote about himself a lot and wrote his own fictionalised autobiography and let someone else write a biography. And um, he took those decisions uh, and Prince decided not to do the same kind of thing. But uh, there probably just wasn't the same outlets for that stuff in 1979, 1981 that there would be now. Yeah, and now... So when those people do come to tell their own stories, there is a chance that they will be disputed and that they won't have the same sense of authority. Right, yes. And of course, it was so unfortunate that Prince was appearing to enter a part of his life where he wanted to take on more of that role of telling his own story and reflecting yeah. on it. And yeah, I'm curious, you know, as a memoirist, what did you make of reading The Beautiful Ones? Well, it, it, um, it would have been great, I think. Um, the, the parts that exist to us, um, I found really stimulating. And, um, you know, it's quite a, a, it's a much more lovable um, version of Prince that comes through than in anything else I'd seen him do, where he is kind of guarded and difficult and... Um, you know, he's got a, got a paper bag over his head or whatever it was he was doing so much of the time in the 80s and 90s that there was this rather charming and open person talking to us. Right. Yeah, I felt that as well. And with his final um, concert tour, too, it was almost like he was doing his own version of like a behind the music, you know, actually speaking about his life on stage, which was so mm -mm -mm. unusual. Um, yeah, just what a what a shame that there wasn't more of that. Um, Have we got lots of filmed performance stuff to come? Well, I I sure hope so. <laughs> but, it, but you know it exists. I I'm I know yeah I know a lot of the well I know you filmed everything. Um, I I don't have any insight into what's in no, the vault, but uh, he filmed I everything, yeah. he filmed everything. Yep, and recorded everything, and um, I know wow. that. That piano and a microphone um, gala that he presented at Paisley Park it was like two shows back to back that were extremely autobiographical and just him alone at, at the piano. I know that's like a burning uh, desire in the fan community because it, it just there's so much about Prince in that that we could learn and study and that's one of my uh, personal wishes <laughs> that yeah, that comes out yeah, at yeah, some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm curious about um, the music that you explored as you're writing this book. You mentioned the Sign of the Times box set. Do you listen to music when you're writing? Can you do that or do you need quiet? No, no. Um, every now and again, um, if I'm feeling too alone in my work or um, uh, I'm in need of some kind of soothing noise, I will try and find a piece of instrumental music that um, is not variable in its tone and, and volume. Um, so, I mean, Philip Glass is perfect if that's what I want to do. That um, it's something that subtly shifts over the course of forty minutes, but doesn't suddenly start going nuts or or, or going or goes quiet. Um, but no, I, it's something I do in between sentences. Even listen to music. Um, but when I'm actually sitting at the computer and writing, then it's usually in silence. So how much of Prince's discography did you explore through the process of this? Were there things that you maybe hadn't listened to as closely before? Oh, there, was, there were tons of things I hadn't listened to. Um, I mean, one of the 
one of the weird things about the modern age is that you can go on, say, Prince's Spotify page, and you suddenly see there's an album there that you you hadn't noticed coming out and then since since his passing even. Um, some of the like that small club show that now exists on Spotify. I didn't see anything written about that. It just appeared. Um, and so of course, you know, you leap on things like that with with great joy. Um, and there were some albums that came out at the time where I, I sort of read a not very good review and thought I, I won't bother with that. It's it's interesting um, how much difference Spotify and Apple Music have made to my life in terms of just financial investment. Um, that now I sit there and I've got the whole of Prince's work in front of me. But I, I was thinking the other day, there was a song I used to love. Um, oh, I know, it was a Pretenders song that was on their live album. Um, called Sense of Purpose. And, and the other day I realised I'd never gone to check out the original. I thought, why didn't I go to check out the original? And I realised it was because it was a time when I wasn't earning very much money and I would have had to have bought a CD for about £15. And then in the meantime, completely forgotten about the song. And, and so there, it's back in front of me. And, and it's kind of a dream for this kind of book to, to have everything available to you um and yeah there were records i'd missed and, and records i presumed were no good uh which in fact have good things on them i don't i've yet to find a, a prince album that has nothing good on it um and one of the things i used was the fan community in fact because i went on lots of chat rooms where they were talking about best 21st century prince songs and um and i made a gigantic playlist of 21st century print songs and listened to them myself and was really blown away by a lot of them. Just had no idea that he'd done this blues album or that he'd, he'd done, um, that, that there were really great, what sound like hit singles lost in the middle of otherwise average records. So it was, the research for that was a great joy for me and will continue to be a great joy for me. I would love to see some of your playlists. Um, are there are there songs that stood out as you know ones that you return to a lot that you maybe hadn't considered a favorite before? I love um, um, "Sticky Like Glue." I'd never heard before. Um, "Pretty Boy," um, uh, the one that's called "The Work." Mm -hmm. uh, didn't know about it. I mean, uh, you're probably having some kind of internal collapse here. Andrew, no, no. How did this guy ever get to write a book about this stuff? But, <laughs> you know, uh, there was a time when I listened to everything. I mean, I, I bought his girlfriend's records in the 80s and before I realised that, that that wasn't really the point of them. I just thought, oh, if Prince wants me to hear this, I want to hear it. I mean, I had vinyl copies of them. And when you get burned often enough, you think, yeah, maybe maybe I'm going to stop for a bit. <laughs> well, I, I personally think that that is one of the most exciting and cool things about loving Prince is that there are just endless opportunities for discovery and rediscovery and re-examination and hearing things in a new way. And I really appreciate it about your book as well that you write about it very openly. It's very inviting. Um, I think there's a tendency when you become like a real, you know, hardcore fan of a, a musician that sometimes you can speak about it in the maybe a more exclusive way or like a kind of a condescending way, but I didn't find any of that with the way that you approached it. It felt like, welcome, well, welcome to the party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, it was funny because when I was writing High Fidelity, obviously some of that was satire about the way that music fans get absorbed into something. And you know, I think there's a scene in the book uh, in High Fidelity where they meet this guy who'd once played, played bass for Guy Clark, I think, um, if I remember, that, that was what it was. And they completely freak out because how could they meet, be in the same room as someone who's played bass with Guy Clark? And, of course, I got a lot of letters from people saying, oh, was it this guy? 
um, and I know him. And I think no, and uh, whereas my mum could laugh at it, which was what I wanted people to do, was to laugh at the nerdiness of it. And, and the people who were too nerdy kind of missed it. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, they, and um, I think that there was one mention in High Fidelity of the Whalers, and, um, and, and I got a letter from Sweden saying, I presume you are not talking about the popular Whalers with Bob Marley. I presume you are talking about the Seattle Garage Band of the 1960s. And I thought, who are these people? I thought, of course I was talking about Bob Marley and the Whalers. Uh, so um, with something like this, yeah, always I'm, I'm an enthusiast first, I guess, and a fan second. And I really don't want to... Uh, do gotchas on people or anything like that just say this is great better than you think yes yeah well as a a person who was once the only woman working at a record store <laughs> and uh <laughs> is steeped in that culture I appreciate both the roasting and the um uh you know taking the alternate route with your writing the because, um, yeah. yeah yes yeah. <laughs> yeah. no it's it's so annoying and and you know, I, I had friends when I was younger. I had friends who who did things like, uh, you know, a friend who had Velvet Underground bootlegs, and and he was trying to play me a bootleg that had been recorded through uh, Mo Tucker's drum kit, and um, and that's that's all you could hear. And uh, I said, you know, this is just like utterly. Put I would rather listen to Abba than to listen to the Velvet Underground through Mo Tucker's drum kit. Do you know what I mean? And um, they're crazy. They're crazy, these people. <laughs> and uh, music is music's for everyone, and you can find good music in any genre. I completely agree. Um, wow. So I'm curious to know, thinking about your history of having your own work adapted, I have a couple of questions about the film element, and you have a whole yeah. chapter about film. First of all, what do you think Charles Dickens would have thought about some of these film adaptations of his work since he was not alive to see them? And you've gone through the process now of watching how that unfolds. Yeah. Um, well, Dickens had the worst experience of being adapted during his life um, than anyone I've ever come across because uh, he was so popular and these books were all published in serial form and and people ran off and adapted them before they read the rest of the book. You know, the book hadn't come out and people, suddenly they'd be on in London theatres. Dickinson had nothing to do with them, had no recompense for it and would sit in a theatre watching someone guess the second half. <laughs> people with much less talent than he had guessing what the second half of his book would be. And you can only imagine what a nightmare that, that must have been, and how embarrassing and um, provoking to, to have to sit through that. So I think that if he were to see that people had taken a great deal of trouble to incorporate as much of his book as they could in whatever format it's in, I think he would have been rather touched, actually. Uh, cinema probably would not be the good medium for him because movies are too short and the books are too long. So for me, um, the BBC adaptation of, of Bleak House that came out at the beginning of the 21st century, which was mostly in half hour chunks, and, and but it moves like an, uh, a series of 24. It's unbelievably good. I think he would have, I think it would have blown his head off, actually. <laughs> One of the troubles with Dickens is that his characters are, I think Jonathan Lethem wrote a brilliant essay about this. They're more like animals than humans. They have these incredible mannerisms, and um, and when he when Dickens just dis, dis, uh, describes them, it's like they have a nose growing out of a nose, growing out of another nose. And then you look at the the, the adaptation, and it's Jeremy Irons or whatever. You think, well, he doesn't <laughs> doesn't look like that. So I, I've often wondered if a cartoon might be a, you know, like a serious animation might be a good Dickens adaptation. Um, but people always say with Dickens, if he were alive now, he'd be writing for Netflix or he'd be writing for HBO. 
And he so wouldn't because the process would have driven him demented. He wanted to get on. And, you know, that's one of the things this, this book is about. That neither Prince nor Dickens could wait around remixing, 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 re-recording for year after year after year. It's like, that's done and I'm getting on with the next thing. Right. That is the section of the book that I think I underlined the most passages um, from because I thought that was just so interesting you know, someone that's more familiar with Prince and his creative process to see the similarities there. Um, I think the similarities are really striking, actually, that, um, that you get this huge amount of result of, of work as a result of their lack of perfectionism. And what's perfectionism anyway? Um, these, these records and these books are surviving absolutely no problem. Um, and some of the things that Dickens did, you know, the, the seat of his pants stuff that he was doing, where he had to hit a deadline, you know, the next day for two different books, <laughs> pretty much. And, and, and these books turn into the old curiosity shop or David Copperfield. They're in our bookstores, in your bookstore, local bookstore now. There's no obscure Dickens novels. Um, and that sort of takes my breath away that, it, it completely transforms my view of what constitutes great work or, or great working practices anyway. Yeah. One thing that stuck out to me is that you, and correct me if I'm or getting this wrong, but that Dickens was also driven by this kind of needing to hustle and continue to get the next project to earn mm -hmm. money and, and keep his career going. Prince did not have that same no kind of financial burden constantly weighing on him especially after purple rain do you think that if not for that financial incentive dickens would have still kept turning through material at the clip that he did yes i do i think he couldn't stop himself i think one of the revealing things is the volumes of letters because there are 12 volumes of letters and um they're about the same amount of writing as his collected fiction and a lot of the letters have been lost or destroyed. He destroyed a lot of them. But, but what there is, you think, well, hold on. You're doing that when? In the mornings, you know, like six or seven letters a day. And he didn't have to do it. And a, a lot of it came from work with committees and theatre companies that he also didn't have to do. Um, so, yes, he had a lot of dependence and he had he had, he had 10 kids um but a lot of the uh the necessity to work he he put on himself and it was nothing to do with earning money yeah um i just want to share a couple of my favorite little passages mm -hmm. quickly in this chapter that we're talking about um i underlined it was funny i was going back through it today and i'm like i don't even know what this paragraph's about but i love this sentence so much the truth is nobody knows anything <laughs> and yeah. you're, ta you're talking about um, Dickens at this point, but I think it, the same could be said for Prince. Like we're trying to understand these people and at the end of the day, we might not ever understand them, but we're still trying anyways. And then the, the other part was this quote that you found from Terry Lewis, where he's, he's talking about Prince's creative urges and, and focus on spontaneity. And he says, you just do it and whatever it is, it's perfect, create and don't ponder what you created. I think that's such great advice for anyone that's trying to do anything. Well, I think that story of the Ballad of Dorothy Parker that Susan Rogers tells, um, where it was the first day of the new recording studio um, uh, that Prince had built himself, and he came straight down, recorded the Ballad of Dorothy Parker, and Susan Rogers, to her horror, is listening back to it, and it sounds like everything's underwater that the, the thing isn't working properly yet. Well, when we hear that song, that's just an interesting effect now. It's like, oh, that, that sounds so cool, the way that that's done. And Prince heard it back and thought, I didn't mean it to be like that, but I kind of like it, and I'd rather do another song than go back and do it. And there comes a point in an artist's career where their mistakes begin to look deliberate. and. Mm. And we contemplate them. We, we don't think of them as mistakes. We think of them as something they were trying to do. Quite often they weren't, and it's a mistake to think that they're not mistakes. They are mistakes. 
But it, it doesn't matter. You, 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 take, you accept them at face value is what I'm saying. Right, right. Um, I want to make sure that we have time to get to some of these questions that are coming in. Um, I have a, a one or two more questions for myself. I'm going to squeeze no, it and then, and then I'll, um, I'll get to these audience questions that we have. Um, I just jumping to the end of the book briefly, I found the way that you describe the end of Prince's life and the end of Dickens' life to be so profound. Um, and the similarities in um, just the arc of their life and the creative churn up until the end and, and the, the way that they died and everything, it was just so powerfully stated. Um, and I'm curious to know, you know, because Prince is a, a passing that we've all been alive for and, and experienced, you know, what comes to mind for you about learning about Prince's death and then having to write about it in this way? Well, the, the thoughts about Prince's death and, and um, realizing that his wealth cost him his life um, is a very sad thought. So, you know, there's a, there's a kind of loneliness in there um, and, you know, the access to things that he shouldn't have had access to and, and all of that kind of thing. But it, when I was reading about the elevator, him being found in the elevator, then I was reminded of this New Yorker piece about um, opiate addiction that I read a few years ago, where, um, you know, terribly sad in different ways, but how people were overdosing on opiates outside because that was the best way of people finding them and bringing them back to life. If you do it inside, then it might be hours before you're found. And of course, Prince lived this life locked away in, in various palaces. And um, I still quite can't understand the, the frantic hurry the night before in trying to get um, a doctor who was a specialist in addiction to come you know, a few hours before he died. That remains mysterious to me. But um, yeah, the, with both of them, the warning signs that it was coming, um, the frantic movement that was involved around that time, not only from people around them, but also those people themselves, that they kind of died in motion, um, uh, almost literally in both cases, actually. And um, it's very sad and very striking that they, their deaths were as singular as their lives, I think. Absolutely. Uh, how did it impact you? Um, Prince's death. Mm -hmm. I would say it was the second most, well, equal first most shocking um, cultural death in, in my lifetime, the other being um, Marvin Gaye and um, of course you know John Lennon's death was symbolic in all sorts of other ways but Lennon's death came at a time where I wasn't listening to any more Beatles people and you know there are lots of deaths of older people where you think the work's probably over anyway and I'm sad that they've passed but as a personal loss to me now given that I didn't know them it wasn't such a big thing. But Prince and Marvin Gaye, I just wanted more stuff and I wanted to go to more shows and I wanted finally to see an after show Prince concert, which I'd never seen. And, um, and it was devastating, actually. Um, I just couldn't believe that it had happened. And um, I play a rather ghoulish game with a, a friend where when we hear of the passing of a musician, one has to be the first to tell the other by text. And, um, and, and usually that, you know, it's like blues musicians, jazz musicians. And I, 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 I was the one who I texted him, Prince, just one word. And for the first time there was the silence at the other end and he called me and, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about it. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Oh, um... I mean, I was, I had to work. So I, um, you know, I went out to Paisley Park before we knew that it was true and um, we had gotten a tip. And so I was the one that had to call 
you know, into the radio station and say the words live on air, and it was oh, awful. awful. Had you met him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. A, I had. a lot of times. Uh, no, just a few times, uh, person to person. I'd been to a ton of his shows, um, but we developed kind of a friendship uh, in the last few years of his life, I guess you would say, um, where he was uh, really en encouraging me and um, just very generously opening the door to me to to be there for a lot of different events. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, it was it was really incredible. So um, I think I might still be processing it. Maybe that's why I'm asking oh, you about it today. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Um, so I want to get to some of these questions and we'll try to lighten okay. the mood a little yeah. bit. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm seeing several questions. I don't know if you know a lot about people here in Minnesota. We love hearing about ourselves. So there's several questions coming in about whether you've been to Minnesota, whether you've been to Paisley Park. Uh, what, are, what are your impressions of, of this place? I went to Minnesota and, and St. Paul on my first book tour. Um, uh, I remember being very cold. Um, I also remember, and I, I've got no more detail than this, I remember going into this uh, beautiful bar. Someone took me to a beautiful bar that was huge and it had old sofas and chairs and um, sat down on the sofa and had a drink. And I was thinking, it made me think about space in America compared to space in London, because I remember thinking, it would be great to have a bar like this in London. And then I was thinking, yeah, but you're never going to get anywhere this size. And then I was thinking, and if you did get somewhere this size, you wouldn't be able to sit on the sofa because there'd be 5,000 people in there trying to sit on the sofa. And I thought, well, it must be great to live somewhere like Minnesota. <laughs> we have so much room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if that was the Loring Bar. Was it on a park kind of south of downtown? Yes. Yeah. It sounds familiar to me. Okay. <laughs> but never been to Paisley Park? No. Well, if you ever find yourself this way again, I would love to go to Paisley Park. I would again. love to go, yes. <laughs> um, okay, other questions. What research resources and processes did you turn to for this book? We talked a little about listening to music, but um, I think people are wondering more about, you know, what books did you read? What things did you look up about each of these uh, individuals? Well, I think the books, oh, uh, if, you, if you go on Amazon and look at the biographies of Dickens and Prince, I, I read both. Um, but the thing that was really interesting to me was the internet research. So I found myself on the, on the kind of, um, you know, just going down wormholes. And uh, I, I spent quite a lot of time, for example, on um, uh, a website run by the Society for Sleep Disorders, uh, because Dickens, actually, his name, one of his characters was used to describe a sleep disorder, because as far as they know, Dickens was the first person um, to, to describe it in, in one of the novels. And um, I was trying to find stuff about both of their sleep. <laughs> habits because it seemed to me that sleep must have been um the thing that where they paid the heaviest price and and that sleep is something that we need whether we even if we've got a, a terrible week where we're, we're working late into the night on deadlines the following week you you're not so busy um but these two guys it was from the age of like 18 to 59 and um and i think that I was coming to the conclusion that their lives were squashed into a shorter time frame. So there were lots of articles that I was reading. Um, I, I, I was reading court judgments against the woman who tried to sue Prince for, um, I think, sexual assault. Um, and um, because, like I say in the book, there's really almost no evidence that he was any kind of monster um that um clearly he, he slept with an awful lot of women but nobody has a complaint really which i found quite remarkable and a, a, an enormous relief when you worship someone but uh yeah there, there were court cases available online and things like that that were really weird 
to read about. I think it was very funny with Prince that the only two people um, who have accused him, one, called, one said he was Satan and the other one said he, was, he thought he was Jesus. And I thought, mm. you can't have it both, both ways. <laughs> wow. I love getting lost in those wormholes. Well, I like well, to think what, of it as... Well, we live it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and also, after Prince's death, then so much more became available um, you know, especially YouTube and things like that, because he used to get it all taken down really, really quickly. And and then suddenly there was stuff that was just a joy. Um, you know, uh, him playing uh, Past the Peas with Maceo. Um, you seen that? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I've never seen that before. And keep finding bits like that. Oh, yeah. I love his love of Maceo just comes through and they're yeah, yeah. anytime that they're playing together it's just so fun yeah his um, face and the, the, the delight on prince's face that it, it, it makes you realize that that was the thing that mattered to him most of all right it was, it was just the art and the music i loved how you talked about not only were dickens and prince both so prolific in creation but also in consumption of work and that that's something that you also related to that just this Kind of insatiable hunger for like culture and art and music and books and just constantly needing to like hoover up all these things and and study them and examine them well that's an, a real point of identity for me because you know probably from the age of 16 onwards i thought oh i'm a weird kid you know um this stuff matters to me way more than it matters to anyone else and um you know i used to go to shows with band uh, with friends and and friends would read books and friends would listen to music but then they'd want to stop and talk about something else and i'd like no i just want to keep going with this and have you heard this then and, and it's especially in days when um nothing was available at the touch of a button that you know the lengths that i had to go to to find it you know physically getting on trains and things. And um, it, it can be quite isolating if, if you care that much about it. So um, yeah, I was sort of proposing a theory in the book that it's consumption that matters more than practice. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a few minutes left. So if you have a burning question, now is the time to get it into the chat or DM. Um, and I, I have a couple of questions that were actually submitted in advance. I'll okay. get to one of those now. Um, this is a great question, actually, because I was thinking about your book as, you know, bringing these kind of fan or scholar communities together, almost like we're at a dinner party together of, you know, pr people that love Prince, people that love Dickens, but maybe, <laughs> ha maybe you don't know anything else about the other, the other, no, yeah. the other person. So what, books um, by or about Dickens would you recommend to us Prince people? <laughs> well, I think that um, my my favorite Dickens novel is, is David Copperfield, um, which came um, a little bit into his career, but was a, uh, it was an autobiographical novel to a certain extent. Um, I think that the joy of Dickens is in that book. I, I, People never believe me when I say he's funny. I mean, he really is like funny in a contemporary way. He's sort of wry and sarcastic and um, uh, silly sometimes. And, and, and then he can switch in an instant to a different tone. Um, and I think David Copperfield shows, shows those uh, sides of him. Um, and Claire Tomalin's biography of Dickens is not enormous and it's magnificent. Um, so yeah, I would I would recommend those two. Uh, the other thing I want to say about Minnesota is, do you know um, Maria Schneider, the yes. composer? Isn't she from Minnesota? She is. Yes, she is. Well, I'm kind of a Maria Schneider obsessive as well, <laughs> and. Um, I interviewed her for a podcast a while back and she had the most beautiful story about Minnesota and the effect it had had on her music and growing up in an incredibly small community where there happened to be a recently retired piano teacher who insisted that she learn theory before she learned to play anything. Um, and it was like this 
tiny community of 200 people and you know she had this amazing experience being taught in this way and it, it became clear that everything came from Minnesota including the sound of her music actually oh, wow I didn't know that that's so yeah. cool um well I love this question that just came in I think it's a great one to end on um this person says I look forward to a day when someone writes about Hornby's particular genius <laughs> in a meta study with a creator from another era who might that be? Who would you be paired up with in a book like this? Oh, Shakespeare, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, well, who do I most identify with from another era? Um, well, I, I think someone who um, wants people to have a good time, but also wants them to... Um, think a little bit as well, uh, but where the most important is, is the combination of, of, of the two. I mean, Evelyn War once said, throwing down a book in disgust, when are these people going to learn it's supposed to be entertainment? And, uh, and I do think that's true of anything, you know, music, books, movies, that fundamentally it's for people to enjoy in their spare time. And if you can do something a lot more than that with it, then go ahead. But um, I like Preston Sturgis. Do me and Preston Sturgis, the filmmaker. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Nick, this has been an absolute delight. I'm just so glad that I get to meet you and to it talk about- It was so much you. fun. I can't tell you, thank you. Oh. Um, and as, again, the offer stands, if you're ever in Minnesota, I would love to take you on a, my nerdy Prince tour, go to Paisley it, Park. Well, it might go the other way around now. <laughs> that's right. That, that's why I come to Minnesota. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm here for it anytime. Okay, Let me know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay. I've got a, just a little bit of housekeeping oh, yeah. to wrap things up, but yes, thank you, thank you. I know that um, I've been told the comments are very warm and appreciative of you take, taking the time to be with us today. And it's just Loved been such, it. such a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Bye, Andrea. Bye. This has been a virtual presentation of Club Book. I just lost my script. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. This has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Carver County Library for the part they played in bringing Nick to us. Before you log off, look for the Club Book survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Have a great day or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks so much for joining us.